Hi, welcome to my unit four activity uh, for biomed. Um, uh, this is my 75th time trying to record this, so let's hope this goes good. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to go off of, uh, these are the questions that I was given to answer back with um, my knowledge that I have of this. Um, so let's go to the first question. Describe two common wounds and the appropriate first aid treatment for them. Now for the first one, I put down burns. That is a common wound. Uh, you cool them down with water. You keep them under cold water. You remove any jewelry or anything around the area uh, so that it won't cause inflammation. Uh, you don't break any of the blisters that you see because the fluid inside the blister is keeping the infection at bay. So you don't want to try and pop them if you see them. You want to try and after that apply lotion that helps with the scarring and everything. It helps it not get so dry and so irritated. And then you bandage the burn very loosely so that it's not on the, on the uh, skin very tightly. It could cause infection. It could hurt the burn even worse. It can make it even worse for you. Okay, so that's what you do. And if you don't, if you don't have any like relief after that, you can take some over-the-counter pain medicine, and that will also help with the pain a little bit. The next one I put down was cuts. Um, I have a cut on my hand that I did this exactly with. I don't know if you can see it's right here, um, but. What we had to, what I had to do was, I washed my hands after that. That's instant reaction. If you get cut, wash your hands, get the infection cleared up. It doesn't always have to be soap and water. It could be water, just water. If you scrub hard enough, you know you could get all the infection out. Um, you want to keep it there for a while, you know, because it is a cut. Um, you just want to make sure that you apply pressure to it if it's bleeding. You want to apply pressure to stop the bleeding. Um, you're going to want to cover the wound with a bandage, a rolled gauze, something along those lines. Depends on how big the cut is. Uh, this is for minor wounds. I did in my case, in my example, I did minor wounds. So uh, what I say after this is change the dressing at least once a day. Or if, it's if it gets dirty or wet, you want to change it as soon as that happens. Because you don't want to use a dirty or wet um roll of gaw or anything along those lines or wet bandage because it won't stick properly it won't stay in place properly and then you'll just pretty much be half your day trying to get that on there and keep sure it's secure and safe and it won't come undone uh if things are not looking good like i would make sure that you have your tetanus shot up to date make sure that you got that so that you don't have to worry about like something bad happening you can get that off of your chest um, and then you want to watch hardly for infection at the end of the day. You just want to make sure that that wound, that cut doesn't get infected. Um, you don't know where you got the cut from, you know, sometimes like sometimes you just see like, oh, I got cut somehow. It could be on a door. It could be on a hinge. It could be on like a knife by accident. It could be like on something that was on the ground, a staple, something along those lines. And it could give you tetanus. You could get in, like get really hurt. So you just want to make sure that you are looking for those signs. Now, um, identifying various types of shock. This is the next question, by the way. I put cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is a very serious uh, thing. It's pretty much where your heart starts to slow. Um, and there are medications that they give you for this, like uh, dopamine and ephrin, ephrin, ephrin. Um, you're given these to increase your heart pumping and it really helps. Um, I put obstructive shock, which basically is the exact same, uh, treatment as cardiogenic shock. Uh, really it is. You give them medicine like dopamine or ephrine and you, uh, it increases their heart pumping because, um, it helps, uh, they have a lower, uh, heart rate. So it helps raise their heart rate at this time. Um, and then I put neurogenic shock because I felt like having the objective shock wasn't good enough. So um, neurogenic shock, the I could only find the doctor's way of treating this uh, because neurogenic is pretty serious. Like you don't just do that at home. You don't go, oh, I'm just going to take care of my neurogenic 
shock right here they usually take you to a hospital or something for that serious matter and you get iv fluids uh vasto vapors and astropine which is a type of medication that will help normalize their heart rate and it will cause them to like be normal and it will, it will get the shock right out of them um so that was the one i put for number two question um of identify various types of shock and the appropriate treatment these were the appropriate treatments i was given uh, there are three, oh wait, um, there are some kinds of poisonings that I wanted to go over that are very serious. Uh, we got food poisoning. Now, these are this is very common that I wanted to go over. First thing you want to do is antibiotics. Think about that. Food poisoning, antibiotics helps. It's a, food poisoning is like a bug that got into your food. And like it, it, it destroys your body. So you want to make sure that you either get antibiotics or something along those lines. But um, you're going to first want to let your stomach settle. Um, try sucking on some ice or small sips of water. It kind of helps just digest your, let your body digest better. Um, or what you also want to do is maybe go to your doctor and they'll give you probiotics before they give you antibiotics, maybe. And you can check this out with your doctor. You could talk to your doctor about these small little things and maybe you can get a better deal on it. Um, and ease back into eating after these facts like if you're treated and you don't have food poisoning anymore you gotta ease back into that eating and avoid the certain foods that you tried before so that you aren't making the same mistakes ever again and then just most importantly remember to rest rest will help your body heal so much easier um if you rest your body just heals so much better than when you're active and working on it and like constantly hardening on your body so um those are the different kinds of poisoning um i'm gonna do one more which is alcohol poisoning um alcohol poisoning is very serious people get into parties uh people have alcohol poisoning at the parties and then in the end everybody ups and leaves the person just laying there and they're gonna die and that's not right at all uh, i think it should be taken very more seriously and what you should do if someone has alcohol poisoning is try to keep them awake you want to keep them in a sitting, not laying position, okay? If they lay down, it's bad. Um, give them water. Water will sober them up. Getting water in their system will kind of decrease the alcohol percentage, and it will make it to where, oh, they can think straight again. Um, and if they're unconscious, you want to check for their breathing and check and see if they even have a pulse. You want to make sure that they're alive if they're unconscious, because, I mean, you really can't do anything if they're unconscious. Uh, and don't give them coffee or caffeine or something that would dehydrate them because it would just make them prone to throw up and it won't be a good idea. It's, it's not. Um, don't let them lie on their back at all. Lying on their back will cause the spinning thing and they'll just start seeing spirals and they'll start tossing up their, th their organs and it will be bad and they're j it's just going to look terrible and they won't feel better. Um, and don't let them drink anymore and don't let them get up and walk around and walk it off like it's not the good idea let them sit take a minute take a deep breath and like think about what they're doing right now it will it will help out so much that's alcohol poisoning i think it should be taken way more serious uh the fourth question i have is types of burns and treatments um now there are three different kinds of types of burns um, there's really four, but for some reason they only show you like them. These are like the main three. So, um, the there's first degree burns, which you run cool water over the burn and don't apply ice to it. All right. You don't want to apply ice to a first degree burn only because it will make it more, it will make it worse. It will make it irritated. Um, and the second degree burn is the same as the first. It really is. You run cool water over it. Don't put ice on it. It will make it worse. Um, third degree burns, these ones are very, very, very serious. The third degree burns can be very life threatening and seems like sometimes the only treatment that's really like successful and makes it look really good is skin graphing. Skin graphing does the best, in my opinion, with uh, third degree burns. And that's what most cases end in is you have to get a skin graft at third degree. Um, so that's question four. Question five says, ill effects of the heat and cold okay so some ill effects of the heat is heavy sweating weakness dizziness visual disturbances 
you know, like seeing stuff, like all of this. It could be very, very, very serious. They could um, almost pass out. It could be like kind of like drowsiness and all this, you know. So it, it could be serious. You need to move them out of the heat as quick as you can. And then as soon as you do that, you want to get them something to cool down with, like water or like something cold, like ice or something, something cold. And then as soon as that happens, you want to remove any tight clothing or any heavy clothing that they're wearing that could possibly cause them to sweat even more. It could be very constricting to them. It could be making them stop breathing. Um, it could just because of the heat, you know what I mean? Like, it's just because of the heat. That's the best way you can get, like, someone to cool down the fastest. Now, with the cold, it's basically opposite. You can get frostbite, frost nip, hypothermia, all these serious things that could cause you to die really fast. Um, you could lose some body parts in the process. Um, what you need to do is move them out of the cold carefully. Because what you got to think is their, their cells or their, like, their body heat is, like, gone. So, like, they, everything to them is going to hurt. It's like, if you touch them, it's like when your foot's asleep. It's like needles, you know what I mean? It's like literal needles. So, like, if you touched it, it would be, it would hurt so bad. So, you got to be careful when placing them into a warm environment. Um, what I would do is I would remove the wet clothes that they have so that they're not cold anymore, which causing them to be cold in the first place. You got to get that out of the way. Then you need to cover them with as many blankets as you can to keep them warm, put them in something warm or get them near something warm. Uh, you want to monitor their breathing because hypothermia can cause your breathing to slow and this gets slower and slower and slower. And soon enough, you won't even breathe anymore. That's what hypothermia does if you get too cold. It stops all motor functions. Um, and then provide warm drinks to like heat up. Because, I mean, you can heat up the outside of your body with covers and all this, but you can't heal your inside without something coming inside. So you got to get like a uh, hot cocoa, hot tea, hot cider, something like along those lines that would keep you warm. Even hot water. <laughs> hot water. Okay. Um, the next question I have is first aid for a foreign object in your ear. So this one's for ears. So in a professional standpoint, they would use forceps, water irrigation, and like different things for like uh, suction catheter. You know what I mean? They would use these common tools to get something small out of your ear. Um, the, the, this is the best way I can do because um, you would usually use tweezers to get it out of your ear yourself. But I think the best option is to get it done professionally because if you try to do it yourself, like even if it's as small as a little bead, it's very, very serious that you do it, get it done by a professional. Because if you do it yourself, you could cause more damage to your ear. Um, so that's how they would do it in turn is they would use these small little uh, water irrigations or forceps or suction catheter to help enhance their ability to save your eardrum <laughs> so if you have something in your ear like that it could help um but there's also things like bugs that could get into your ear any kind of bug gets into your ear they will have you come into the office point your head upwards like this and they'll pour either baby oil olive oil some kind of oil in your ear and will make it to where the bug will eventually just come out itself it, it helps uh, get the bug out and that's only if that's like a bug in your ear. You wouldn't do that if there's like a bead or something or like something in your ear. It would mostly be because of that. And they do the same same idea with splinters, like cuts in your ear, anything along those lines that you could get into your ear. It, it, that's what they would do. Um, now, number seven is very important because primary care. We are talking about primary care. Now, the question asks if. There was a huge emergency going on, and there is a whole bunch of people who are injured. Who is the one that you would help first? Now, this is in my opinion for the primary care one. Um, I think someone who is not breathing is should be your primary objective because 
you got to understand that there is this saying that people do that find, okay. As a general guide, I guess you would say, as a general guide, the quiet need more help than the guy with a serious cut that's screaming, okay? So the guy who's screaming right now, at least he's breathing, at least he's alive. But the person who's not breathing and is unconscious should definitely get looked after first, in my opinion, because, I mean, they're, they, they're on the verge of dying. They're on the verge of dying. I understand, like, the more time you wait on that person who's hurt, who's screaming, they could get infection or something along these lines. But the person who's not breathing could end up dead. And I'm over here looking at infection on someone who's alive. You know, like, so in my opinion, the person who is not breathing should get looked after first, in my opinion, or the person who is unconscious. Those are unresponsive. The unresponsive get checked first. Now, number eight. Number eight was kind of hard for me. Um, these are basic skills. These are basic skills that they asked us to do. Uh, BLS. Uh, and some of them, these are, these are very simple. Okay. We have chest compressions, which chest compressions you do in CPR. Um, you have the pocket mask unit. I have my own pocket mask unit. Uh, I don't know where it's at for the video because I couldn't find it before the video or else I would have shown it on the video. But I have a pocket mask with uh, the adult pocket mask and the baby pocket mask just to just in case if I ever need to do CPR on someone, I don't get a disease or something from the other person. I can do CPR safely. Uh, next uh, is bag mask a bag mask i've used whenever i went to um anthus uh school uh i had to do demonstrations with a bag mask a uh, bag mask basically looks like your regular pocket mask like the front but it extends out to this big bag that you can squeeze onto and it's just applies air way easier it just uh, gets air to the person better um, if someone per se, if you didn't want to breathe into it, like lean over and breathe into it, it's mostly for two man people. If you're two manning a CPR at one time, that's what's best is to use a bag mask because, you know, you're you're not you're not giving them your own air either. You know, like you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then there is the use of a defibrillator. The use of a defibrillator I did whenever I was at Anthus too. Um, they made you, they were these test uh, defibrillators. They weren't like real ones. They didn't like shock or anything. But um, what you did was you just uh, had them in the setting position. They would say charging, charging, charging. And then you would basically, after they said charge, you would pick them out of the thing. And then you would, you would pretty much say clear. And then there would some, then whoever is on, if you're on a, uh, cpr team with someone then you say clear they'll go clear and then they'll back up exactly like this they'll put their hands up and then you shock the body right right up here okay um and then you do it again charge it up if you need to again and use it again that's uh one of the ways that they show you how to do it um if if you can't uh, use the defibrillator. They show you how to do it. It's really, really uh, a good exercise. All of this information is very good information that they put out there. Uh, I think it will help out so many people if this was way more, you know, put out there. Um, primary care, uh, BLS skills, foreign object removal, illnesses of heat and cold, and then the burn treatments, the different kinds of burns, the common wounds, the different types of shock, and the different types of poisoning. These are all common things that can happen to anybody at any time. And it's just good to stay in contact and stay in knowledge of that fact that these are what you need to look for. Uh, this is my unit four activity for biomed. I hope you enjoyed. Um, it was really fun making this. It was a really good experience. Uh, I had to record this many times, but thank you. Have a good day.